of air. Where? Here. A small step for mankind, but a giant step for us. One of the uh, most interesting things to come out of this, besides the whole war aspect, um, was that uh, up until now, uh, Vladimir Putin had this aura of um, being like this, this cruel but calculating and super competent uh, kind of mastermind house of cards type leader. Um, and the Russian army uh, of being this again, like, brutal, powerful, world-class military force that only another superpower like the United States could contend with, and that to do so would mean total destruction for both sides. Um, but now we're days in, and they can't seem to hold a city in little Ukraine, which isn't actually so little. They have an extremely seasoned military. Um, but, you know, like, I didn't think I would see the day when we can say with some degree of cause that Vladimir Putin might actually be an incompetent idiot. Um, actually, uh, on that note, there's uh, an interesting Twitter thread that would be interesting to go over, it being an interesting Twitter thread that is how these things tend to go. Um, let me pull that up, because it's, it's very illuminating. It's a very interesting analysis. I read it over once earlier this morning, but it's good. I have no idea who this guy is, but, no, I don't want to open paint. There we go. But here we are. Let me make this a little bit bigger. By Camille Galiv. Excuse me. Uh, why will Russia lose this war? Much of the realist discourse, the realist quote-unquote discourse, is about accepting Putin's victory because it's guaranteed, quote-unquote. But how do we know it is? I'll argue that analysts, one, overrate the Russian army, two, underrate the Ukrainian army, and three, misunderstand Russian strategic and political goals. Consider a timely paper on the Russian army by Bismarck Analysis. It's good and informative. It's correct on uh, its land-based... Uh, and artillery essential character. It's also correct that the uh, Minister of Defense, uh, Sergeyev, greatly increased the Army's efficiency in 2007 2012, but it's still misleading. Actually, can we, uh, is there a link to this or is that just a screenshot? Technological advance strength in Russia's, oh, it's just a screenshot. Okay, but anyways, we, we get the gist. So, yes, Minister Sergeyev indeed reformed the Army, that's him on the left. He increased its efficiency, fought with corrupt and crony armament producers, improving the army supplies. As a result, he became extremely unpopular, made tons of powerful enemies, and was ousted in 2012, losing his power and status. His successor, Shoigu, knew better than this is Shoigu here. Shoigu knew better than that. Now, who is Shoigu? Shoigu is the only, quote-unquote, single... Sorry, not only, quote-unquote, just the only, emphasis, only Russian minister who uninterruptedly worked in government since 1991. Since the very beginning of, Russia, of the Russian Federation, he worked for every president, all prime ministers, and avoided every purge. What does it mean? It means he's a cunning political entrepreneur, great in court politics, publicity, and image. You survive every single administration by maxing your political survival. And to max it, you need to minimize animosity, so you never object to powerful interest groups. And here's the rub. Sergikov fought with interest groups and was destroyed. Shoigu was smarter than that. He launched a PR campaign, presenting himself as the quote-unquote savior from Serdyakov's legacy. Whatever his predecessor did was dismantled. Media cheered, people cheered, interest groups cheered. That's a very, very typical problem. Efficiency maximizing requires ruthlessness in dealing with established elites and interest groups. Meanwhile, court politics maximizing requires pandering to them. He says pondering, I think he meant pandering. Pandering to them and not making enemies. Serdyakov is maxing efficiency. Shoigu, court politics. There was another issue. I actually haven't... I, I, don't, I forgot this part. Uh, Shoigu is ethnic Tuvan. In such a country as Russia, minority member minority members can hardly become the supreme leader. People don't perceive him as an ethnic Russian. Uh, see his palace. That's actually really cool. Honestly. Which means he's not dangerous for the leader and you can safely delegate him to the army. Sorry. He's not dangerous... Right. So he's not dangerous to Putin. 
so you can safely delegate the army to him because he's not seen as one of them. So basically what happened was uh, Putin took a man who was very good at ingratiating himself to the higher-ups in the, in the Russian government um, and to Putin, uh, who was safe because he didn't have the capacity to lead a coup, essentially, um, but uh, acquired that, st that position by uh, effectively undermining efforts by the previous, um, by the previous uh, army leader or, or general um, to make the Russian military more efficient and more powerful, which means that there's effectively been an incompetent um, in power over the Russian army since 2012. Shoigu not only purged Serdyakov's appointees, so not to mention uh, uh, a removal of all personnel chosen specifically for competence by someone who is concerned primarily with the efficiency of the army, uh, pandered to old military establishments, stopped arguing with army suppliers about the equipment cost and quality. He also pandered to numerous feel-good lies regarding the Russians' uh, grand strategy. Uh, he says Russian big strategy. I think it means grand strategy. Let's consider the army versus navy problem. Army versus Navy has been a traditional dilemma of European powers for centuries. As a rule, you couldn't support both first a first-class army and a first-class navy. You had to choose. Uh, sea power states goes into this a little bit. You might disagree with this somewhat, but yes. Some powers ignored this to their demise, like 17th to 18th century France. Others were more rational, like Russia. We forget, but in the 17th century, uh, the Principality of Brandenburg, centered in Berlin, tried to play into a global maritime power. They built a navy, established colonies in Caribbean, in the Caribbean and Africa. Uh, super costly, uh, super hubristic, and very stupid. It consumed tons of resources in vain. You can see the rage is starting to influence. <laughs> it's like grammar here. In 18th century, they reconsidered. They sold their colonies, dismantled the navy, and started land maxing. I don't know what this guy's first language is, but he, he's it's it's like it's hyper coherent. It's the, he's has some interesting terminological choices like land maxing. I don't know if that's that's normal in in his field or whatever. It's just, I like it. They correctly realize that if they suppress their hubris and minimize the navy to zero, they can land max and build the first uh, and build a first class army, which would then unify Germany. So land maxing requires minimizing naval ambition. Does Russia minimize its naval ambition? No. It feels obliged to maintain uh, as much Soviet legacy as possible. Keep old ships afloat, build new ones, maintain and expand infrastructure for the ocean navy. Here's another dilemma. Regional fleets, regional fleets rather, can be effectively used in land wars. For example, Russia declared quote-unquote navy maneuvers and then attacked Ukraine from the sea. That's cheap and effective. But keeping a regional fleet doesn't sound sexy. It's efficiency maxing, not PR maxing. I wonder why that is a regional. I guess because you have the idea of um, of a fleet as being, uh, you know, it's 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 your window to global interference or intervention. You can have a fleet anywhere. That's what it's for. The army is the thing that's supposed to be difficult to move. The fleet is supposed to be untethered. There's an entire um, chapter in Schmidt's The Nomos of the Earth that goes into that, which I've quite forgotten. I should re review that at some point. Like, I haven't forgotten the spirit of it, but the details I have. And Russia is PR maxing. Putin declared that the share of new ships should reach 70% by 2027. Old Soviet ships are becoming obsolete. Russia is building new ones. But major Soviet shipyards are located in Ukraine. So now Russia expands shipyard infrastructure to reach this goal. No wonder they're having various logistical issues with them running out of rockets, fuels, and others. Yeah, that, this would seem to, at the very least, contribute to an explanation along those lines. Soviet naval legacy is a curse of Russian military. The USSR could afford ocean fleets with carrier strike groups. Russia can't. But abandoning Soviet ambitions would require suppressing their own hubris, which is impossible. So, they strive to maintain it. Ergo, they can't and won't. Landmax. And here's an additional factor. Um... Putin appears to be relying almost entirely on uh, smoke and mirrors to maintain this aura of competence. Once deployed in the field, encountering any exigency or any inconvenience, it appears like they just they lose the plot. We are days into the invasion of Ukraine. Mere days. We have him citing Russia's missile capacity publicly. So, they strive to maintain it. Ergo, they can't and won't landmax strive to maintain their own hubris.
How does it reflect on this war, the war with Ukraine? First, the Russian invading force was small. It has lots of artillery, of course, but it's not numerous enough to win. Pro-Russian analysts compare their, their advance with Barbarossa, but unlike the Wehrmacht in 1941, Russian invaders have only one echelon of troops. Let's look at this. Oh, God, that resolution is terrible. Russian attacks and troop locations. Born. Someone help me out. What, what does that mean? One echelon of troops. It's a quote, so that's that's somebody else's language. How is a blitzkrieg organized? Oh, here we go. He's going to explain it. Brilliant. By echelons. The first echelon is moving forward as fast as they can. Of course, this means that lots of defenders will be left in their rear. But then the second echelon comes. Then the third, etc. They finish defenders, occupy territory, control the supply lines. Yes, okay, that's what he means. They had one wave, effectively. So it, it comes in waves, right? So the tanks go... They, they do a sweep. They miss a lot of the defenders uh, in the process. But then a second wave comes and gets them from behind. Or gets them, uh, gets who gets the stragglers. And a third one comes. And at no point are any of the echelons themselves actually tired out from combat. Sort of like, um... Like 300, Xerxes at the hot gates, right? Um, the Persians send in one wave. They retreat, then send another wave. They retreat, recover, send another wave. Now, a little bit different, obviously, because they're passing by. So it's like, it's like a raking process. As opposed to um, just like wave after wave hitting like a, a stationary thing. But you get the idea. So uh, in a Blitzkrieg, first echelon moves forward as fast as they can. Uh, leaving a lot of defenders because they're not doing a thorough sweep. But then the second echelon comes in and then a third, etc, etc. And then these ones are responsible for clearing up and occupying territory. So the front line is always far away from the territory you're trying to hold. So the enemy is always on the back foot. They don't have time to, uh, they don't have time to um, recover and and, re and and counter. If Russia launched a proper Barbarossa-style blitzkrieg, that would happen now. First, second, third echelons. But the second echelon didn't come. It never existed. Why? First, Russia is not land maxing and thus doesn't have the resources and infrastructure for the land war. Secondly, launching several echelons would require long, arduous preparation. You need to mobilize them, move to the borders, quarter, maintain, and supply. It's not that easy. It's a hard job that should have been done well in advance to wage a blitzkrieg, and it hadn't been done. Why Russia didn't prepare? Why didn't Russia prepare for a proper blitzkrieg? And now we come to the third and main reason: blitzkrieg is a war strategy. Blitzkrieg is how you break and suppress the enemy who's actually fighting. Russia didn't plan it because it didn't plan a war. It planned a special operation. Of course, that's just modern discourse. After World War II, traditional understanding of sovereignty as a legal right of sovereign rulers to wage offensive war died. As a result, modern states never admit they're waging wars. They're waging pacifications, counterterrorism, etc. By the way, this is a uh, very, very high-level analysis. His grammar is breaking down like nothing I've seen, but um, this guy I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to in the future. This is, this is very smart. Consider how all the war departments and ministries over the world were renamed into quote-unquote defense in late 1940s. Everyone's defending, nobody's attacking. Why does the fighting happen then? Well, because of criminals, bandits, terrorists, jihadis, or as of now in Ukraine, Nazis. Nomos of the Earth, Carl Schmidt, he goes into this. Um, modern, the modern world abolished the distinction between the enemy and the criminal. A key, oh, he's, he's taking this directly from Schmidt, actually. I guarantee you. The modern world abolished the distinction between the enemy and the criminal, a key idea of Roman law. Powers do wage wars, but to do so, they need to criminalize and dehumanize their enemies. There's no such thing as a use hostis anymore. Hence, all of the quote-unquote terrorist discourse. In a sense, Putin is going with the flow. But on a deeper level, Putin is absolutely correct. His declaration of special operation in Ukraine is sincere because he didn't expect the war. He doesn't know how to do wars. For all of his life, he's been organizing and launching special operations. First as a KGB officer, then as, Saints, then as a St. Petersburg City Councilor for Foreign Affairs uh, 
illegally selling Soviet warehouse uh, materials to the West. In 1990s, he closely worked with the criminal world, and he did it successfully. Here you see him with a thief-in-law, Grandpa Hassan. I don't know who that is. Um, not that Hassan. Uh, Putin worked with violent entrepreneurs used to killing, but he always had the upper hand. The federal and regional governments were very much stronger than these criminal bosses who were very much replaceable. Every one of them had dozens of henchmen who wanted to take his place, like Putin. Putin waged special operations when he had much stronger op when he had a much stronger position than these criminals, and he got used to that. Later, Yeltsin chose him as a, as a successor, and in this capacity, Putin launched a bunch of special operations to consolidate his power, again with full support from the higher ups. Yeah, Putin played badass even before becoming a president, but it was easy to play a badass when he was backed up by then president and the entire apparatus of the Kremlin. Huge power, but no risk and no accountability. Later, he initiated conflicts each time uh, to boost his popularity and his tough image. Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, but neither of these was a war, I'm going to add in the proper sense. Every conflict was a special operation, waged for political goals and against a small force which had no chance to win against Russia. Does he continue? Is that the end? That might be the end. Let's see, he might have continued down this thread. He did. Perfect. Putin fought only with small countries. Chechnya, one million people. Georgia, I assume he means four million. Uh, or something. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what this means. Uh, Syria had more, but he fought with rebels with no proper training or armaments. Also, quote-unquote, counter-terrorist discourse allowed Russians to simply level entire cities to the ground with no consequences. Every time Putin needed to confirm his alpha status, he would devastate some little country with a special operation. They didn't require proper preparation, because they bore no existential risk to Russia or to him. Like, what are they going to do? No risk equals no need to worry. Putin decided to repeat this little trick again, hence not that numerous, hence uh, an, an, a small army of invasion. Only one echelon of advance, etc. But Ukraine is much bigger uh, than Syria and Georgia. It is 44 million people. What was Putin thinking? Apparently, he was expecting zero resistance from the Ukrainian army. Putin had good reason to believe so. Indeed, in 2014, Russian regulars easily destroyed Ukrainian forces in uh, Dobotsevo and Ilovesk. Ilovesk. He saw that Ukrainian that the Ukrainian army is weak, and he can easily rout them simply sending Russian regulars. And as we saw in a previous stream covering this, um, there's a Rusi article that uh, suggests that while um, their surveys of the uh, the attitudes of Ukrainians to defending their government suggested that a overwhelming proportion of them, or it seemed like an overwhelming proportion of them, wouldn't. Uh, rise up in defense of their country in the event of an invasion and had little faith in the government. The uh, Russian intelligence didn't take into account that this situation would change given the reality of an invasion. And as we have seen, it did. Strategically speaking, Putin fucked up. He defeated the Ukraine, inflicted pain and humiliation. Anyone with an IQ above room temperature knew the war was not over and Russians would strike again, but... Putin didn't finish Ukraine back then. He's talking about uh, 2014. He thought he'd always have a chance. What happened next is quite predictable. Inflicting a painful but not critical defeat on your enemy is risky. This is what Machiavelli says. Um, don't harm your enemy. If you're going to harm your enemy, make sure that you harm them enough that they can't harm you back later. Inflicting a painful but not critical defeat on your enemy is risky. Yeah, they kind of became weaker, but the balance of power within them changed. Court politics maxing interest groups lost, and efficiency maxing upstarts get a chance. This is actually something, I'm not a military, military historian, but from my limited reading, um, even in like a mythological sense, this is very typical. The best generals and the best fighters come from parties and countries and kingdoms and uh, are led by individuals who have failure in their history. Um... What comes immediately to mind is um, Cao Mengdi from uh, Three Kingdoms, who uh, loses over and over and over again. Um, 
early, early on in the war against um against Dong Zhuo. Um but as a result, uh he is forced um he is forced to learn uh cleverness. Um he defeats most of his enemies by not being a victim of his own pride because that's been taken from him. Um he is he is loved by his army because he pays attention to them. He doesn't hold himself aloof from them, and he pays close attention to what they're doing, and takes an interest in what they do. And he doesn't allow his own station um, to cloud his judgment, uh, like um, Yuan Shao does, which is why he defeats him with an army ten times its size. So yeah, the Ukrainians became kind of weaker, but the balance of power within Ukraine changed. Court politics maxing interest groups lost, and efficiency maxing upstarts uh, started to get a voice. The formula of institutional evolution equals scare plus don't finish them off. Napoleon smashed Prussians at Jena Arstead, but didn't finish them. Prussia evolved. Commodore Perry scared the Japanese in 1853, but the U.S. spiraled into civil war and left them alone. Japan evolved. Nothing motivates as hard as an existential threat. First, Ukrainians admitted the truth. I'll be frank, today we have no army. Now we can assemble a group of 5,000 capable soldiers max out of 125 on paper. This is a report apparently from the Minister of Defense in 2014. In 2014, Ukrainian uh, equipment was awful. Almost 100% vehicle and ammunition, almost 100% of their vehicles and ammunition were 25 plus year old uh, Soviet stocks. Moreover, most of it just expired. Like vehicles, they existed on paper, but were never checked or used since 1991. Their radiators, accumulators were rotten and unrepairable. Note the, um, the contrast, by the way. This is not the description of what happened with Russia. Russia had hitherto not suffered a defeat, which means that, potentially, all the things that uh, Ukraine was a victim to in 2014, Russian military may have been. I don't know that for a fact, but this account makes me wonder. The radiators accumulators were all rotten and irreparable. FSB colonel, the FSB colonel who led the pro-Russian insurgency in 2014, uh, this is in uh, Crimea, admitted it created a problem for him too. He wanted to restock from the Ukrainian military warehouses, but that stuff just didn't work. They took 28 anti-tank missiles and fired them all during the Nikolaevka battle. None of them worked. <laughs> Good God. Judging by the interviews with insurgents, who, with insurgents who were disappointed to find that rockets, shells, grenades taken from Ukrainian warehouses were 99% dysfun dysfunctional. Jesus Christ. Which makes sense. They were 25 years old and not, not taken care of. It's not surprising Ukraine lost to Russia in 2014. Their fucking bullets didn't shoot. Or, or their, their shells didn't explode. It's surprising they could fight at all. Even the ancient Soviet radio missions, machines didn't work. They had also... Um, uh, very recently by that point, uh, denuclearized too. Because they had nukes. They were a nuclear power. Um, good luck uh, seeing a small country with nukes disarm now. <laughs> into the future. Like, good God. It's not surprising Ukraine lost to Russia in 2014. It's surprising they could fight at all. Even the ancient Soviet radio machines didn't work. Ukrainian soldiers had to communicate with SMS, and since network the network was often... Uh, Awful, they had to throw their mobile phones up in the air in the hope maybe it will catch radio signals a few meters over the ground. Good God. That's how the Ukrainian army looked back then. No wonder it was immediately crushed by Russian regulars and uh, Debaltsevo and Ilovesk, and Putin had every reason to believe that resistance will be broken the moment he launches his regular army en masse. Except he had no reason to assume that. This is actually, like, when you think about it, like, for us, we don't, we aren't thinking about this constantly, right? But why isn't Putin thinking about this constantly? This this should be like what's on his mind all the time. A lot has changed. First, Ukraine has had six drafts. Men were drafted and sent to Donbass, then most mobilized and returned to civilian life. This Donbass contingent was around 60,000 soldiers and constantly rotated. So now Ukraine has 400,000 veterans of the Donbass war. I had not accounted for this. Um, I didn't know the history of the draft in Ukraine, um, but if that's, but th this changes things a little bit. This means that when they draft um, civilians to uh, fight against Russia, they're drafting people who have military experience. 
Many of them were in combat, thus Ukraine has a huge number of veterans with combat experience, probably more than Russia. Yes, Russia has been fighting in Syria and never published the size of its force, but it's estimated to be between two and 3,000. Most Russian soldiers have not seen war. Furthermore, uh, the combat they've seen, the kind of combat they've seen is different. Russian soldiers are used to fighting only when they have total numerical superior superiority and technical superiority, I assume. In Syria, they would just level cities to the ground with bombers. Meanwhile, Ukrainian soldiers have fought only against far stronger and better equipped enemies. So they're conditioned uh, to be fighting a an uphill battle, like a severely uphill battle. Equipment-wise, this war took the Ukrainian army uh, half resupplied. It developed many, uh, a lot of innovative weaponry of its own, but almost none of it was produced on a large scale. In most cases, soldiers have only few prototypes of new Ukrainian-produced weaponry. Ukraine ordered 48 Turkish Bayraktar uh, TB2 drones. That's not bad, more than twice what Azerbaijan had in Karabakh, but only 12 of them got to the troops by now. Ukraine is also developing new, stronger drones, uh, Bayraktar uh, can see together with the Turks, but it's too late for this war, of course. However, Ukrainians got a number, unpublished, of American-produced javelins and M141 bunker defeat, uh, bunker, or those, those called like bunker busters, uh, and anti-bunker munitions, and uh, British-Swedish-produced MBT uh, laws, together with Ukrainian-produced anti-tank weaponry, such as... Uh, Stugna, I don't know these things. Big boomsticks. Um, the Ukrainian troops hadn't received many new tanks by the time Putin attacked, but they got new armored vehicles, such as domestic-produced Cossack IIs with Turkish-produced uh, Aselsan fighting modules and a number of American armored vehicles like Humvees, etc. Finally, Ukraine created a new type of troop. The Troops of Territorial Defense, whose number is estimated in... Uh, to be about 60,000. It's a copy of the Polish troop type. These are civilians who get military training and can be mobilized in a day to fight only in their own town and region. So presumably they're also trained regionally, so they have a specific local advantage. Why? Well, that's obvious. If Russia made a proper blitzkrieg with several echelons of attack, Ukraine would lose anyway. But Russia didn't, and Ukrainians bet that they wouldn't. First, it's costly and difficult for a state security regime which isn't landmaxing. Second, Putin expected the Ukrainian army to run away or surrender in the first day, like most of foreign observers expected. Now they're of course changing the narrative, but if you look at their posts a few days ago, they didn't believe the Ukrainians would make any real resistance. So Putin attacked with only one echelon. Troops pushed forward, leaving many non-destroyed Ukrainian regulars and levies behind. In a proper blitzkrieg, a second and third echelon would have come to finish Ukrainian defenders. But they didn't. These additional echelons didn't exist. So this is where it all comes to a head. Uh, Ukraine, while being uh, relatively under-resourced and, and significantly weaker, um, wasn't hubristic, knew it would lose, and took every precaution to be as strong as possible and as, as, as ready as possible in the event of a full-scale invasion. And Russia categorically failed to deliver. These additional echelons of a proper blitzkrieg didn't exist, which immediately created the supply and replenishment problem. The first echelon pushed... Oh, shit, that's right. Huh. The first echelon pushed forward. It needs uh, supply, it supplies and fuel. It needs ammo, uh, and it needs people. But these supply convoys are being attacked by the regulars that a second and third echelon would have taken care of. Um, so the regulars in the territorial defense troops are killing their ability to maintain the first echelon, which is the only fighting group they sent. So it's, it's, what I'm getting from this is the Russian army deployed like a wave, one wave that just swept the country and there were just trucks giving them fuel from behind. There wasn't a wave and then another wave and then another wave. And then trucks interspersed and trucks in behind that. So you have a severe, you have like a clean sweeped countryside and, and clean sweep territories going behind the front, the attacking force at the front. That didn't happen. So all of these supply lines, which are, which are not nearly as equipped as the, the rushing group at the front, these are all being taken apart by all of the troops that the first wave missed.
Антоне, ёбаные, блядь. Годэм. Это все в буче, в буче. Молодцы. ВСУ, молодцы. I, I can't distinguish Ukrainian from Russian. I can't tell if that guy's having a good day or a bad day. I'm going to assume bad day. What is this? Oh my god. That's what a drone strike looks like. God, can you imagine being in that? Oh, thank you, Titan. I love this. Apropos that point earlier um, about the uh, the best generals having experienced actual loss and defeat. This is from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Quote, victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Brilliant. Oh, I, and I completely misread that. That was not what that was saying at all. My point still stands, but what Titan was saying means something different. Um, victorious warriors win first and then go to war. So, uh, speed. Putin did not win first. He also violated the do not delay rule. Seems to be. And reportedly, uh, by the levy whom the government just distributed guns to, these people would be unable to stand against the Russian columns, but they can attack convoys. Consider that Ukraine has many veterans with combat experience among the civilians. Right. So, a second echelon, like fully armed with tanks, they couldn't stand against that. But once that first wave passed... They can easily take out the trucks. Uh, Strokov, who led a pro-Russian insurgency in 2014, confirms this version in his telegram. Supply columns are being destroyed because there's no second echelon. Putin is apparently concerned. In, the video, uh, in a video on the 25th of February, he called, for, he called for the Ukrainian military to do a coup d'etat. He wouldn't need it if his plan worked in the first place. Uh, what does it mean Putin's plan didn't work? Because he didn't plan for war. He never fought a war, and he has no idea how to fight wars. He has always been doing special operations, and this is a special operation too. They should have just run away or surrendered, but they kept fighting. The defeat in this op- I, I assume it means the, uh, the Ukrainians. The defeat in this operation will inflict enormous consequences for Putin and his regime. They are unlikely to survive this defeat. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm skeptical that Putin will survive this defeat, but I don't know about the regime. Meanwhile, it's unlikely that Putin wins by the same methods. Wait, oh, does he mean uh, Ukraine? Because Ukraine's not defeated yet. It's not that Russian morale is low, it's rather that it depends on how hard the war is. Or that morale dep oh, God, you, you gotta work on your... You gotta edit these, dude. <laughs> Most Russian troops would be enthusiastic or wouldn't mind against a small foreign vacation with fun and adventures. Fighting a hard, long war with the real possibility of death is another matter. Oh, I see. He's rushing because his laptop is dying. The morale of Russian troops is widely overestimated. According to sociological studies, the main motivation is to, en to enlist is usually to get an apartment. They are usually young men from underprivileged backgrounds with no real prospects in life. There's a chance to get housing from the state. By the way, this is why um, you should never be, like, cheering when you see uh, Russian soldiers being brutalized or mutilated in the field or blown up or whatever. Um, they're, they're victims of their system as well. Um, it's good that they're losing. It is very good on one level when they get blown up because it stops an annexing power from pro 
you know, progressing to steal the the lives and livelihoods of, of victim people, but at the same time, just keep that in mind. Um, the Russian army isn't Putin. The Russian army are victims too. At least a lot of them are. Now, if you're dead, you can't get a house. Uh, perhaps those already in Ukraine have little choice, but the very fact that resistance continues, or as bloody and casualties are real, would hugely demotivate those back at home. I expect no enthusiasm there on the Russian side. I also understand that a lot of the Russian army is, um, is, uh, drafted as well. <clears throat> so what can Putin do? He can start destroying infrastructure, which he's done. He can blockade cities, which he's done. He can level cities with bombers and artillery, like in Chechnya or Syria. The first two would inflict humanitarian catastrophes, and as he hopes, break the will of the Ukrainians. The third one, however, of leveling cities with bombers and artillery is more problematic. Unlike Chechnya or Syria, where you could easily justify open genocide with quote-unquote fighting jihadis, which is a fair play in the quote-unquote war on terror. He's talking about the logic of the war on terror. He's not saying it's a fair play. Here it will be more difficult and actually might draw a NATO response. Still, I can't exclude this. Um, so my prognosis is, if the fight continues and victory is not achieved, I would add swiftly, Russian ability and willingness to fight will be disappearing quickly. Putin doesn't have a choice, but many of his subordinates do. Even in case Russia doesn't technically lose and some source of armistice or agreement is achieved, Ukraine has in essence already won. Why? Many describe this conflict as kinetic, uh, but I'm calling BS on that. Human conflicts or interactions are not kinetic, they are mythological and run by myths. I don't know about this distinction, but let's run with it for now. Money is a myth, it exists only because we believe so. Power is a myth, nation is a myth, institutions are purely mythological. Consider the story of the burning of Moscow in 1572. Ivan the Terrible divided his country to Zemshina and uh, Oprichina, taken apart. Jesus Christ, how much longer is this? Okay, <laughs> we're almost there. Um, Oprichina was under his personal rule. Oprichniks, his forces, launched a terror campaign against Zemshina. They slaughtered uh, the noble houses, massacred cities, killed enormous numbers of commoners, facing no resistance. Why? Were they strong and brave? No, because of the myth. Russian people existed within a myth of orthodox monarchy. Of course, there would be individuals who would get, go against the orthodox czar, but it was impossible to organize a resistance against him. Thus, resistance would be individuals and easily crushed by organized Oprichnik forces. I hope I'm not butchering the pronunciation of that. Oprichniks became very brave and badass because mythology of the Russian people prohibited, because the mythology of the Russian people prohibited 99% of them to resist the security forces. So with the time, so with time, they decided that uh, they are in fact really cool. So in 1572, when Crimean Khan, when the Crimean Khan, I assume, attacked Moscow, Oprichnik forces went to face him. Kinetically speaking, they had overwhelming superiority. Guns, cannons, much heavier armor or weaponry. Their defense and firepower is very much stronger. But they were routed in one day simply by arrows. Why? Because they were used to fighting people whose myth prohibited uh, actual resistance. Within the Muscovite mythology, uh, Oprichniks were invincible, untouchable demigods as hands of the Orthodox Tsar, who's like a living god. But when facing a foreign enemy, they left this mythological space and entered a new space where they are just people and can get an arrow in the face. I was reading something else about this earlier. Um, uh, it might have been from him, but it might have been from an article elsewhere. I don't know if it, it might have been by him, for all I know. But it was talking about how the uh, mythos of Putin that we even have in Canada in some cases and the U.S. And a lot, of, for God's sake, uh, epic rap battles of history had something like that. And it was sort of tongue-in-cheek. Scrawny guy going like, bro, oh, you want to mess with me? I spit hot bushel. I'm crushing these beats. That, um, it's tongue in cheek and it's it's like a joke, but it's not that kind of joke. It doesn't say that he's weak or that he's human. It says that he's comical, but it seems like a part of Putin's mystique is that like he's he's comical and there's like a, an almost Trumpian level of pretense there, but it reflects. Unlike Kim Jong-un say, like actual power underneath, or it conceals actual power underneath. 
the Ukrainians apparently didn't have that sense. And it appears they had good reason not to, because it seems like they had a closer finger on the pulse of the state of the Russian military than the Russians did. They, the Aprichniks, uh, the invincible hands of the Orthodox Tsar, were not used to getting arrows in the face. The very realization they were not demigods but mortals shocked them. They ran away, dropping their armor, guns, and cannons. Moscow was burnt to the ground despite having total kinetic and technological superiority. So power is mythological. The Russian state security are gods in their own mythological space, where they represent the godlike state. But what they found was that Ukrainians had left this mythological space, thus the Russian state security had no power there. They were just mortals. And finally, the very fact of resistance against so much superior, uh, a, a, a such a vastly superior enemy, empowers the Ukrainian mythology. That's something else, too. Um, the surprise. Um, this is something, again, Machiavelli goes into a lot, um, often in terms of, uh, like, relations between princes. So somebody who, or, or between princes and their people or whatever, somebody who has a reputation for cruelty who gives clemency um, is received with much more gratitude and much more benevolence than somebody who has a reputation for clemency who gives clemency. One is unremarkable and breeds contempt, the other one is like, you fear this person, but now you have an avenue to allow yourself to respect them. Something similar is going on here. The uh, Russian military is overwhelmingly powerful. The Ukrainian military is perceived to be overwhelmingly weak. Um, just as now it is suddenly revealed that the Russian military has a, a deep rotten core of incompetence and, and failure to prepare and corruption, um, the Ukrainian military now seems brutally efficient in order to uh in order to hold on for so long despite that other that other characterization so um at least from the outside it appears like morale has gone way up just because of the people were unexpected they could nobody expected them to fight back as well as they did and maybe that's because of russian incompetence but it doesn't change the fact um the very phenomenon of war is inconceivable without taking into account the mythological dimension. Consider Venice. When Napoleon came, they surrendered without a shot. Very smart. It saved a lot of lives, and it saved the city. It just killed the mythos of Venice. People lived, but the Republic died. It was never restored, and it's unlikely to be restored again. Theorists of war of the bygone age understood it. Clausewitz pointed out that it's important not only if you lost independence, sorry, not only that you lose independence, but how you lose it. If you submit without a fight, sure, you save lives, but you've also killed your mythos. You'll be digested by the conqueror. Um, Hobbes. The entire uh, notion of the Leviathan. The, people confuse the Leviathan with the state all the time. The Leviathan is the person of the state. This is what Pinker gets wrong, too, because he's an idiot. But the Leviathan is not the sovereign. The Leviathan is the person of the sovereign that is projected as a monster. And so far as it is a monster, you believe it can hold everyone to their contracts, including you. And that's what keeps the state together. If you don't believe that that's the case, if it stops being a dragon and starts being a little butterfly, then um, you uh, you will not fight as hard as you will um, for its defense. You will not fear it. You will not be loyal to it. You'll have contempt for it. But if you lost after the brutal and bloody fight... Uh, your mythos is still alive. The memory of the last battle will live through the ages. It will shape the mythological space of your descendants' lives, and they'll attempt to restore independence at the first opportunity. So optics are everything here. This is really crucial. Um, like, what what is what is Ukraine? Uh, on one level, it's a vast expanse of dirt and rock and trees and water, like every other place on Earth. Um, on another level, it's uh, buildings. Look, this is a place where we go to work. Da, 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 da. There's resource extractions, people are building stuff, whatever. On another level, there is an organization um, of citizens um, that has its own uh, its own kind of integrity that doesn't exist in a material plane, um, and its own identity, which also doesn't seem to exist in a material plane, and its own power, which, what is that attached to? Its capacity to survive a war, its capacity to meet exigencies, the appearance of its capacity to meet exigencies. Practically, are these distinct?
So if you lose, after brutal and bloody fighting, even if you lose your state, the Mythos is still alive, which means that even occupied, the memory of Ukraine remains, because, and, and, and thus the, the, its capacity to rise again remains. Um, there is the capacity for there to be a revolution, uh, or a reconquista, or something along those lines, and for Ukraine to rise again. Why? Because Ukraine didn't die. Ukraine dies when it stops being a dragon, when it stops being a leviathan. And thus far, uh, the war has only cemented the image of it as that, from my layman's vantage.